visiting Burma, the wartime base from which he planned the rout of the Japanese, is Lord Louis Mountbatten accompanied by his wife and daughters. Burma, no longer a British colony, has seen many changes since the war, but religion still dominates the life of her people. No visit to Rangoon is complete without seeing the famous Buddhist shrine of the Shui Dagon Pagoda, containing sacred relics of the Buddhas. Here the visitors are initiated into the ceremonial rites of the Buddhist faith, which remains unaltered amid the whirl of political changes. Today's voicemail is taken from the book The Hidden History of Burma by Tan Mian U. He writes, quote, Until the mid-1990s, Rangoon, the port city of Burma, was a time capsule. The city was not only Asia's last intact colonial era landscape of buildings, but was home to an unparalleled collection of sites belonging to the world's religions. It was home to cathedrals, Protestant churches, an Armenian church, a Jewish synagogue, dozens of Hindu, Chinese, Sikh and Pari temples, Buddhist pagodas and monasteries, and dozens of mosques. It was a landscape with a bloody history of war, riots, rebellions, colonialism and anti-colonialism. It is for the Burmese a physical connection to their past. Welcome to part one of Burma, a crisis of history. I'm your host, Mr. Amin, and in today's episode we're going to be exploring the country known as both Burma and Myanmar. So prior to reading this book, my knowledge on Burma was quite limited. Um, I often heard about it in the news in relation to two things. The first one was I kept hearing about this woman who was supposed to have been democratically elected, but these like military men kept putting her under house arrest. And then the second thing um, is the Rohingya crisis, which has been labelled as a genocide. Um, so having finished the book now, I've come to realise and appreciate um, just how complicated Burma is along many layers of ethnicity, uh, religion, nationalism, and also uh, the economic infrastructure and just how much it's changed and not really for the better um, as the years have gone on. What I'd like to do is start off with five key facts about Burma, facts which have stood out for me and they point to or will indicate to some of the deep-rooted issues this country is grappling with. And like the historian Min U um, says, these facts tend to fall into two main categories, which he has analysed, and that is the crisis of race and the crisis of capitalism. So, fact one, there's anywhere between 130 to 135 ethnic groups within Burma's present day borders. Fact two, from 1962 to 2011, the country was led by a military dictatorship. Fact three, crony capitalism and illicit industries have turned Burma's economy into a beast. In 2019, the Burmese army led a large-scale raid on one of the insurgent ethnic groups, uncovering one of the biggest drug holes seen anywhere. 18 tonnes of meth in the form of 200 million tiny pink pills and over a thousand gallons of methyl fentanyl, a synthetic opioid more powerful than heroin, which kills thousands of Americans every year. And fact four, the Anglo-Burmese wars were the most expensive wars fought in British Indian history. It cost the British anywhere upwards of 30 billion US dollars today and costed the lives of 15,000 British and Indian troops and an unknown but certainly higher number of Burmese. And finally, fact five, by the early 20th century, Burma was the world's top exporter of rice. Now, as I was reading this book, I kept thinking about the issue to do with uh, 20th century decolonization, uh, the recurring pattern of how European empires gave rise to a host of nation states, which in turn have given rise to instability because the structure of the nation state doesn't properly reflect the reality on the ground. Uh, the idea that there's a fixed border where a certain group of people will live and will prosper is quite arbitrary. Now, that isn't to say that under pre-colonial empires or kingdoms that these areas were peaceful or, you know, united all the time, but the difference between them is the scale and nature of violence, of racial thinking or eugenics, as it was called back then, and the imposition of European ideals onto people. 
As I'm recording this episode, um, this week the US left Afghanistan following 20 years of American rule and, you know, the result is so catastrophic and complex, it's really hard to know what to say. Now, in Burma, the British left in 1947, so since then, Burma has had nearly upwards of sort of 70 years of violence and instability, um, which boggles my mind. I was also quite drawn to the story of Burma in terms of its similarities it has with uh, the Ukraine um, when it comes to having a dominant force beside you. So uh, Burma is surrounded by India and China. The Ukraine is surrounded by Germany and Russia. And also when it comes to the mix or clash of religions or ethnicities and how much border politics comes into it, so the geography of it all, like if you live in the lowlands or the highlands or the, or the cities, it's all going to affect your livelihood. Um, and then there's also the impact of living history or the memory of that place for these people. So for the Ukrainians, Russian dominance looms large in their psyche. Now for Burma, whilst China hasn't really seen it fit to invade in any real sense, the way that uh, Russia annexed the Ukraine a few years ago, um, China is still very much interested in Burma, more than what meets the eye, and China has used the insurgent ethnic groups, which we're going to um, talk about, who have so-called shared ancestry with the Chinese in order to extract profit and also political leverage, especially post-2011 when the Burmese government was making steps towards allying itself with the Western powers, uh, which we'll talk about later as well. So, in Burma, as I said, there's around 130 to 35 recognised categories of ethnicities. And in terms of religious beliefs, it differs from group to group. There are strong forces of Christianity and Islam spread out across these groups, with the dominant religion being Buddhism. Ethnicity has been a source of turmoil in Burma's modern history, and the conflation of the word ethnic group with tribe or nation has led to all types of chaos. Now, its geographical location is really important to grasp, um, so both internal and external geography. So externally, the fact that it's surrounded by larger entities like China and India, but then also Thailand, um, Bangladesh and Laos as well, has meant a steady and continuous migration and influx of people. I think the best way to grasp some of Burma's demographics internally is to use its own geography. And bear in mind as well, the borders that we have today of Burma were drawn up by the colonial powers. Um, but prior to colonisation in the 1840s, the Burma that we know now looked vastly different and was in no way, shape or form, quote, unified the way that we understand that today. So the main region of Burma is the Irrawaddy Delta, or Basin, which is, in many ways is the beating heart of this region. The people who live in the valleys or plains are dominated by the Burman, or the Burma, along with the Shans, Mons and Arakanese. Now we're going to go through in more detail as we go who each of these people or groups are, um, but just to go back to the geography, um, the Irrawaddy Delta is a really rich and fertile heartland, um, and historically speaking, it has been the region which the Burmese themselves or foreign invaders have latched onto. Rice is grown from the water, irrigated from the river, and the river itself is a mode of transport upwards to China and India. Burma is also a really rich country in natural resources, so to the west, east and north of these river valleys, the forest produces teak and hardwoods, along with rubies, gold, silver, and Burma has a unique monopoly um, on jade. Uh, it currently produces anything over 70% of the world's supply of jade, almost exclusively to a growing and insatiable upper-class Chinese population. So the geography determines the resources, which in turn affect the ethnic groups in different ways. The second layer of geography are the mountainous regions, who have had relative autonomy historically speaking. These people are primarily called the Kachin, the Karen, and the Chins. There's also a large uh, non-indigenous group of Chinese and Indian minorities due to either 20th century or recent migration. Along the west, which is the coast of the Indian Ocean, there's a state there called Arakan, where people called the Arakanese live. Um, as well as the people who we know, or actually they call themselves the Rohingya, 
uh, people. Now, Arakan has a really important place in current politics and the insurgency that we're seeing there, as well as the obviously the Rohingya genocide itself, has its roots in medieval and also colonial times as well. And one final disclaimer. Burman or Burma refers to the majority people. Burmese is the language of the Burman or the Burmas, and it's also the name uh, for citizenship as well. Um, and hopefully you're getting a sense of how complex and how many different sort of just numbers of uh, people there are in Burma. Burma is definitely a place where identity is unstable. So in episode, in this episode, part one and two, we're going to be taking a long durée approach of history and I want to get across a couple of things. First one, political instability in Burma stems from historical precedents. Democracy in Burma is not the kind of democracy that we understand in the West. Burma's economy was decimated by colonial rule and then currently by crony capitalism. The military dictatorship has evolved in surprising ways over the years. And finally, until Burma or Myanmar uh, knows what it truly wants, peace or unity is going to be a pipeline dream for its people. So around a millennium ago, the word Myanmar, minus the R, first appeared in inscriptions describing a people living in the valleys of the Irrawaddy region and their language. And over the centuries that followed, successive kings called themselves Myanmar kings. Now by the 17th century, the word was colloquially pronounced as Bama, so B-A-M-A. And when the first Europeans arrived, they started calling it various derivations of Bama, um, until the English changed it officially to Burma, um, when they colonised it, even though in Burmese they continued referring to it as Myanmar. Then in 1989, the military dictatorship changed the official English name by adding an R to it to extend the vowel, so it's Myanmar. They justified it by saying that it was a more inclusive term, which unfortunately was not true. Few indigenous and ethnic groups in Burma would agree that the term Myanmar, or even Burma itself, applies to them. And in the West, to show their dissatisfaction with the uh, dictatorship, they continued saying Burma. Regardless of what name you choose though, the word Myanmar has these nativist or ethno-nationalist connotations to it, and Burma itself is a colonial product in many ways, so, so there's always going to be an awkward or unsatisfactory footnote. I'm going to go with what Min U has written or used, which is Burma. Let's start Burma's history. So, during the Middle Ages, the Kingdom of Pagan, or sometimes it's written as Began, uh, emerged, and it's credited as being the first Burmese kingdom that would unify sections of this region for the next 250 years, laying the foundations for a future modern-day Burma. There's two versions of the start of this first Burmese kingdom. So some early Burmese scholars pointed to the kingdom of Nancho, an area in uh, Yunnan, which is a province in western China, that had reportedly attacked a people living in Upper Burma in AD 832. And among these Nancho troops were a group called the Nian, a Chinese term for people who spoke the Burmese or Old Burmese language. And the story goes that once the uh, kingdom of Nancho took over the Irrawaddy Delta, the Burmese speakers broke away from the kingdom and decided to form their own kingdom there. Other historians point to evidence saying that actually there were Burmese speakers living in the Irrawaddy Delta um, before the attack, but regardless of the historical accuracies, um, we know definitely that by AD 849, a walled fortress uh, called Pagan had been built and quickly became one of the greatest medieval Southeast Asian kingdoms. Now, the kingdom of Pagan declined politically by the 13th century, whilst also defending off attacks by the Mongols from the Yuan dynasty. Um, but having ruled for so long, they had brought about significant changes. Um, so, for example, a new system of irrigation of the river valleys, they embedded Buddhism into the religious fabric of the region, and they had established trading networks with the surrounding communities um, of Burma as well, as well as externally with China and India. And even after the fall of this first kingdom, several followed 
competing for geography or trade. There were many different ethnic groups alongside the Burmans. So when the ba- when the Pagan kingdom uh, disintegrated, Upper Burma separated into three main polities, each one led by an ex-royal member, and then Lower Burma became independent. And in this power vacuum, two new kingdoms emerged. One was called the Ava Kingdom, founded in 1364, and the other one was the first Pegu kingdom, founded in 1385. They say that the Avar kingdom was led by members of the Shan group, who were ethnically Shan, but had been Burmarized, i.e. that they spoke in Old Burmese, um, and that continued to be the lingua franca of the kingdom. The Shan um, are the biggest minority group in Burma, and they supposedly have ancestral links to the Thai ethnic group. Now, the historian argues that the kingdom of Ava, led by Bamarized Shans, is quite significant because essentially there was a power shift away from the majority Burmese-speaking people to Shan ethnic rule, if you like, um, which would have significant implications for the country's modern-day politics. Fast forward to 1947, when they're drawing up the new constitution of Burma, the new Shan states lobbied for special concessions during these negotiations. Um, and it continues to have a destabilizing effect in the 2000s as well. Skipping forward to the 18th century, in the 1740s, a new dynasty of Burmese-speaking warrior kings emerged, who would later be known as the Kambang Dynasty, or the last Burmese empire. Now, they were expansionist, and they united a lot of the south and unified the Irrawaddy Delta as well, as well as founding the port of Rangoon. They also pushed eastwards and conquered nearly all of Thailand and modern-day Laos as well. They fended off a number of Manchu Chinese invasions from the north, and the empire hit its peak in the 1780s when they founded a new capital city called Amarapura, um, known as the Immortal City. They believed themselves, this new dynasty, to be this all-vanquishing group of people, that that they were these amazing conquerors. And in 1784, they turned westwards, I set on Arakan. So Arakan is that important state I mentioned at the start of uh, this episode. That's where the current Rohingya crisis stems from. Now, obviously, currently, uh, Arakan is under Myanmar sovereignty, but it has a historical record of being separate or an independent entity from the Burmese kingdoms. There's not much archaeological evidence to support for sure who were the early inhabitants of Arakan, but based on surrounding patterns, it's likely that they were Burmans or Chins, who are a Tibeto uh, Sino ethnic group. The Arakanese Chronicles dates back to 3000 BC, with the legendary founder being an individual called Maru The chronicle states that from that point, around 60 or so kings emerged and ruled Arakan until 1404, and then in the 4th century BC, other sources begin to mention Arakan as well. Now, the excavated sources were written in Sanskrit, which actually suggests that the Arakanese have their origins in India, as opposed to being Tibeto-Burman, so clearly the um, ancestral links of the Arakanese are debatable. Regardless, politically speaking, the Arakanese kingdoms were autonomous. The second kingdom to emerge was known as Vesali. Over time, the cities along the coast became successful trading ports. They extended their territory into Chittagong, which is now a part of Bangladesh. They traded with uh, the kingdom of the Burmese, as well as China and the Mons, with India, Bengal and Persia as well. Now, Buddhism thrived um, in Arakan at this point, evidenced by the numerous pagodas, monasteries and shrines. As well as Buddhism, as time went on, later Hindu and Muslim kingdoms of Bengal reached the northern part of Arakan, and their religious practices and languages filtered down as well. So, for example, Pali is an ancient and sacred language. It has its equivalents to, like, Latin for Europeans. Pali is believed to be the language spoken by the Buddha itself, a sort of Indo-Aryan Sanskrit mix. Um, Like I said, these languages are ancestral and have similarities to the present-day dialects of the people known as the Rohingya. 
And so these Arakanese kingdoms, for example, the most famous one is Muraku, uh, they prided themselves on their classical education, on their languages, on Buddhism, and on their autonomy. Now, it wasn't just the Arakanese, by the way, but many Burmese viewed India really highly. Uh, the Ganges is known as the birthplace of, of Buddhism itself. Um, so Indian classical culture and language was highly regarded by people from the Burma region. Now the Arakanese, their sovereignty was very dear to them um, and they did not see themselves as being a part of or like akin to the neighbouring Burmese kingdoms. They were also rather cosmopolitan as we say these days. They had, uh, the rulers freely adopted Bengali or Muslim titles, they traded with Europeans, they had Persian poets at court, Afghan archers and even samurai bodyguards from Nagasaki. Now this reputation of autonomy and pride was cut short in 1666 when the neighbouring Mughals from uh, the Indian subcontinent captured the region of Chittagong, chopping off effectively the northern part of the Arakanese kingdom. Then to the east, the Burmese kingdoms came charging through. In 1785, they set fire to the capital, they raided the cities, and in their final show of destruction, they removed the holiest of symbols of the Arakanese, which was the statue of Mahamuni, the most sacred image of all. And bearing in mind that Buddhism was sort of the state religion, if you like, or at least the kingdom's main religion, um, there was a sort of there was no separation, if you like, between Buddhism and sovereignty. It was very much intertwined. So the Arakanese, now effectively made to be subjects, spent the next part of history under Burmese rule and then later on British Burmese rule as well. Now, initially under Burmese rule, i.e. the, the Kongban uh, dynasty, um, they forced entire Arakanese communities over hills uh, to build irrigation works near the capital and in the Irrawaddy Delta, effectively being used as slave labour. This oppression sent thousands of Arakanese to flee into British Bengal at this time, uh, and a really striking similarity is that the Arakanese refugees settled in the exact regions which 200 years later the Muslim Rohingya uh, are camped in currently as refugees too. So the Kongbao dynasty didn't stop there. Once it had annexed uh, Arakan, it wanted to keep on going. They marched in and seized the kingdom of Manipur, an Indian state today, and then moved down and seized the kingdom of Assam as well. Tens of thousands were also similarly forced into farming for the Burmese as well. The Manipuris remember this period as the seven years of devastation. However, Arakan was not completely subdued. Rebel forces sprung up. Um, and what ended up happening was British troops were being sent to confront Burmese troops who were in turn pursuing the Arakanese rebels who would escape into Chittagong uh, to you know, get out of um, Burmese sovereignty. Um, for the Burmese, it was clearly unacceptable for their own subjects to be attacking them, but then for the British as well, who had by now taken over Bengal, it was equally unacceptable for the Burmese troops to be so close um, to the Bengal region, which at that point was the most prized possession of British India. Now, this is where the British enter the story. Now, British entry into the history of Burma was preceded by longer and older stories of European travels to the Far East in the form of traders and adventurers and Christian missionaries. The Dutch and the Portuguese had a trading presence in Southeast Asia from the early 1500s, playing an important role in trading in new food and goods in return for firearms, cannons and military tactics, which the Burmese dynasties had recognised um, as being important in a fast-moving world. In the 1930s, um, Ashkenazi Jews had escaped European anti-Semitism um, and they ended up going to Rangoon, numbering about 2,000. Armenian communities had also settled in the country since the 1600s following deportation um, and aggressive sort of uh, policies towards them from the Ottoman Empire. But external forces were soon at work which would soon propel the British to stake a claim to Burma and consequently the British would begin scooping up all the different power bases 
of Southeast Asia into their hands. Angered by the aggressive overtures of the Burmese, so remember they had already taken over Assam and Manipur, which was to the north, and um, were now beginning to push into Bengal, the Governor General of India declared that the British needed to, quote, humble the pride and arrogance of the Burmese monarch, end quote, which would eventually launch the First Anglo-Burmese War. And the British quickly showed their strength. They took back Manipur, they took back Assam, and also they defeated them in Arakan. They also launched an ambitious uh, amphibious landing on the port of Rangoon, and they pushed the Burmese back into the inlands. They used rockets and the world's first steamships, which pulverised the Burmese, who kept sending in wave after wave of cavalrymen. Two years later, the Burmese king sued for peace. The Treaty of Yandabo in 1826 formalised the end of the First Anglo-Burmese War, um, as well as asking the Burmese, well not asking them, telling them that they had to pay an impossible reparation amount of £1 million uh, back then. The Brits also took um, back Assam, as I mentioned, um, and they turned it into the world's tea garden. They took Arakan, which became the first appendage of British India, and would later become the first piece of British Burma. Now, this defeat was a massive shock to the um, Kongbang Empire, who believed in themselves as being this all-powerful, conquering race of people. And 20th century nationalist thinking harks back to this date of 1824 as being a cut-off point. This uh, cut-off point was the idea that if you entered Burma after 1824, then you were dealt suspiciously, you were seen as a foreigner or as an invader, whereas if you were in Burma prior to 1824, then you're... Um, native to the region or you're you know you have you have ancestors there again this would have important implications later on because after the british took control many of the arakanese refugees who fled during the first few conflicts returned back to arakan even though they had fled to bengal or you know what we now know as bangladesh so the second anglo-burmese war followed shortly after in 1852 the British took the Irrawaddy Valley and all of Lower Burma, and the British essentially at this point had their sights set on complete control of Burma. Of course, all of this was going on at the same time that Britain in, uh, domestically was experiencing the Industrial Revolution, um, and so it was really important for the empire to keep on harnessing the power of its colonies and also expanding. It was actually Churchill's father, as in Winston Churchill's father, who was called Randolph Churchill, um, who was Secretary of State for India in 1885, who launched the third and final Anglo-Burmese War. Yeah, he told his voters in Woodstock, Birmingham, that access to markets in Burma would lead them into China, and that would in turn create jobs. Um, so all of this was happening within the context of Britain's domestic affairs at this time. It was peaking during the Industrial Revolution, which also coincided with the ideological belief in their supremacy and their right to lead the world. So in 1885, the third and final war was launched. The city of Mandalay fell quite quickly. Um, the British set fire to the libraries, which contained the official records and genealogies of the Burmese ruling classes. The Brits then continued to fight inwards across um, the delta into towns and cities, and they were met with quite fierce resistance once they reached the more rural parts of um, Burma, which surprised them. One colonial officer wrote, quote, uh, The people of this country have not welcomed us as deliveries from tyranny, end quote, which, you know, is a classic imperialist line. Anyway, years of brutal fighting went on, um, a famine ensued, about 40,000 uh, ethnic Burmese and other ethnic groups uh, suffered and died. There were summary executions of prisoners, including the crucifixion of Burmese fighters as well. And when it ended and the dust settled, little was left of the region once known. And as Mint U puts it, uh, at the end of this chapter, he writes that Burma, as we know it, was born of a military occupation. So it was redrawn into three main zones. The first part included the Irrawaddy Delta and the Arakan. Um, they were run directly by colonial administrators with a governor in Rangoon. 
The second part was the surrounding upland valleys and hills ruled indirectly by local princes and chiefs. And then the third zone was the sort of the mountainous regions claimed as British Burma, but were pretty much left to fend for themselves and they were labelled as unadministered zones. Like elsewhere in their colonies, the British used a divide and conquer method as their policy. At the same time though, we have to remember that when they entered this region, the population was already ever shifting and moving, as we have seen um, how fluidly competing kingdoms rose and fell throughout Burma's history. What the British did was pillage and fire guns, and then bringing their own ideas on administration, they imposed it onto this already shifting and dynamic landscape. But because they had no real understanding, the way they categorised and um, you know, set up these areas, it was new, rigid and quite explosive fault lines which they created around identity and it only worked primarily for their economic exploitation, not for the nation building which they loved to say that they were doing. What did the British do in Burma? For many local communities, British colonial administration was quite faceless. Um, it was often an intermediary, like an official or a sepoy, who would come round to collect taxes and divide land up. Now, these new tax collectors replaced the traditional local elites who had previously developed systems of collection themselves, and who also had a significant amount of discretionary power to, for example, relieve tax burdens on a village if they knew that that place had had a bad harvest or a drought. By eliminating these headmen, or these sort of previous structures, it meant that they were essentially out of a job. It undermined the network of relationships that tax collectors had created, who understood properly the issues facing each town or village they administered. The British went on by introducing new laws, whereby landowners had to pass exams to survey their lands in accordance with British customs. Free access to forest products was denied, um, the forests were instead leased to British timber firms. Steamboat technology took over the Irrawaddy River. Um, the most sort of the biggest one was the British Irrawaddy Flotilla Company, which became a dominating presence um, on the river itself, affecting the livelihood of the valley communities. And under the British, Burma became the top exporter of rice uh, throughout the 20th century. Burma oil was set up, funneling black gold back to India and Persia. Um, and I just overall, I think it's funny how uh, there's like, the you know, the Germans have a reputation, a unique reputation of being psychopathically efficient. And I'm not saying that the Germans, you know, haven't demonstrated such behaviour in, in their history. But I feel like the British don't get that same reputation when they should, um, which is evidenced by their you know, in their imperial projects. They certainly knew how to squeeze the economic life out of their colonies. The three wars ultimately ended uh, the Burmese kingdoms and reduced them to shreds in a matter of 60 years. They exiled the Burmese monarchy, they put forward new colonial lords, uh, trade was taken over and thereby access to resources as well, religion was undermined and the imposition of British ideas on ethnicity or language all mixed together into a part of future disaster. The removal of the king, who was a symbol of protection and leadership, but who also had a role to defend and promote Buddhism and its doctrine, stripped the religious fabric of Burma. It, you know, sort of removing the Burmese king was as fundamentally destructive, you could say, uh, for Buddhists as it would be removing the Pope from Catholic Europe. And quite a few historians describe this act, this process, as a decapitation, effectively bulldozing down completely the historical structures within Burma. Of course, not all groups within Burma saw it this way, as not all of them were Buddhist or not all of them were Burmese, but for the majority, and even for those communities who did not enjoy Burmese sovereignty, it was still a profound shock because it altered things, it altered who were the new competitors, you know, that there was now a new power in charge, completely foreign and endlessly ruthless. For the British, however, this was simply a process of what they called adding another jewel to the Queen's crown. Now, Mint U describes Burma as being born of a military occupation, but once it was pacified, 
Burma was raised up in a racial hierarchy. So a small Burmese elite was allowed, but obviously, in essence, the ruling races were the Europeans. And then coming into this mix was Indian labour. So Mint U describes the process uh, through which the British administration encouraged Indians to migrate to Burma to work there. And he essentially says that cheap Indian migrants became the new proletariats of Rangoon. The migration of Indians to Burma was one of the largest migrations in the 20th century. By 1931, Indians comprised 7% of the total population, which at that time was 14 million people in Burma, um, and a mix of 1 million Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims within that percentage as well. Now, for centuries prior, as I've mentioned, the Burmese had viewed India very highly as a prestigious place, something to look up to and admire, but under colonialism, this perspective was flipped completely. Now the Indians were seen as these, you know, foreigners, as invaders, and also as sort of dirty exploiters, as servants for the British doing the menial work, exploiting Burma for them. Um, there was also a small class of Indians who thrived. For example, the Tamil Chattiyas from Madras um, thrived in the banking industry, giving out loans to um farms and you know landowners in Burma. This antagonism would come to a head though, so during the Great Depression um, commodity prices fell and villagers who took out loans for their farming from these Indian bankers were unable to keep up with paying um, back these loans. Um, so the Indian bankers um, would seize their lands because they you know, weren't, weren't getting their compensation. Millions of acres worth of, of land was confiscated from these Burmese farmers. And in the 1930s, Burmese Indian riots left hundreds of people dead. Now, when it came to racial thinking as well, the British did their own thing too. So the Burmese of the ro old royal courts recognised the linguistic and ethnic differences of their kingdoms, but there was no stringent classification the way the British did it. So for the Burmese, they had these five overarching categories. You were like either part of the Myanmar, or you were a Shan, or you were the Mon, or you were the Kala, or the Tayuk. So the first three I've mentioned, the Myanmar, Shan, and Mon, they were sort of classed as indigenous peoples um, from like Burma or Myanmar itself. Kala is the word for a Westerner or an Indian, and Tayok refers to the Chinese likely derived from the word Turkic. Now, in contrast for the British census takers, who are really keen to classify literally every village in every town across Burma, as soon as they stepped out of the cities into these more rural communities, if you like, they realised how shifting um, and dynamic ethnic groups were, and they viewed it with dread. They saw it as a place of racial instability, where nothing was easy to pin down, and nothing seemed logical. Burma's Muslims were also equally hard to pin down. There were Muslims who had originated from the Yunnan province of China following Manchu repressions in the Middle Ages. There were Muslims from the 17th and 18th century who were descendants of soldiers who had fought for the Burmese kings who were originally from the Deccan in India. During the Arakanese kingdoms that I mentioned earlier on, they were also slave traders and they traded Muslim slaves from Bengal who settled into the northern and middle parts of Arakan. And then in the 20th century, hundreds of thousands of Muslims speaking the Chittagong dialect of Bengal came to Arakan and by that point, Muslims formed about a third of the population in 1911. At the same time, Burmese, so the, the, the ethnic Burma, the Burmese themselves, from the Irrawaddy were also moving into Arakan as well, and they made up about 15% of the population. So ironically, whilst British imperialism was trying to pick apart all these intertwined strings of ethnicity, religion and skin colour, under their rule, the strings simply became even more mixed up. Now, the term Rohingya was never used by the British themselves, according to Mint Yu, but rather by the Muslims from North Arakan. Um, in their dialect, it literally translates into, quote, of Rohang, and Rohang is their name for Arakan in their dialect. Um, so by doing that, it implies that they have an indigenous status, that they are of Arakan itself, from the land 
um, of Arakan. It's it's kind of similar to um, the Crimean Tatars in episode two when we talked about how they indigenized the territory to make their claim to it, you know, completely watertight. Um, now this term would later and will later become contested, hotly contested by Arakanese Buddhists who do not want certain groups of Muslim communities to claim indigenous status um, to Arakan itself. But under British rule, as I mentioned, it was never used by the Brits themselves. They would instead use a term like Mohammedan Arakanese to refer to the Muslims. Now, there were also segments from other minority groups um, who saw the British as an opportunity to raise their status. So there was one group called the Karens. Now, they're a group of Sino-Tibetan language-speaking peoples, and they actually are not homogenous. They, like, within that category, there are a number of different smaller ethnic or linguistic groups. Um, now, I think they're like the third largest minority group in in um, Burma. Now, the word Karen is actually an anglicized term of the Burmese word, which is Kayin. Um, and the Karens are actually a relatively modern creation under British colonialism, essentially. Um, Baptist missionaries were quite successful in converting them away from animism to Christianity. And because of this, they were favoured by the British. And with this favour, a sort of separate identity formed, which was not, you know, which was separate from the Burma or the Buddhist um, counterparts of Burma. And so the Karen National Union formed, which represented their interests with the British. There's also the Kachin peoples. Again, they're a confederation of groups who I mentioned earlier as being part of the northern regions of Burma. They neighbour um, all along from Yunnan to Assam and India. They speak a language called the Jing Fo language. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, which is originally from China, but they also have numerous dialects as well. Um, and different groups. Now they also um, have Christian counterparts too, but they actually became Christians through American missionaries earlier, way before British rule um, sort of started. Now because of their Christian, um, you know, acceptance, they were favoured not just in administrative jobs or, or you know, in, in farming, but they were also used in the military and they were gradually replacing the Burmas, the ethnic Burmese, which added to this idea of a perceived collusion on religious lines mostly, that many of the non-Burmese groups of Burma were working with the colonials at the expense of the Burmese, and that would all add fuel to the fire once the British um, left Burma in 1947. With the rise of nationalism in the colonies in the 1910s and onwards, the message of home rule was gathering momentum in India and had spread into Burma. The older generation of Burmese who had been educated in Oxford and Cambridge were pressing for constitutional reform. There was a younger generation who dreamed of revolution. Many of these revolutionary dreamers read Marx and Lenin and the work of Sinn Féin inspired by the growing IRA. These younger generations of um, politicians or of Burmese figures, they formed something called the We Burmans Association. They purposefully used the Bama or Burman word, emphasising a folk identity. They were not a fan of parliamentary politics. Their political spectrum ranged from left to right. Some formed the first communist parties in Burma. Others would use or reuse the old royal signs of the Burmese dynasties. All of them pointed anger towards big British businesses and immigration policies under colonial rule. When these demands had reached to a head, in 1937 the British formally separated Burma from India, and Min U describes this as India's first and forgotten partition. Nationalist feelings had reached a high point within Burma. Um, Islam, which was the religion of approximately half the immigrants, uh, were being described in pamphlets as being a threat to Buddhism. Perhaps the uh, Burmese were seeing what was going on in India between the Muslims and the Hindus and the gathering momentum for a um, Muslim homeland, i.e. Pakistan. Um, but all of these sentiments well together 
adding fuel to the fire, and in 1938, a new round of riots between Burmese and Indians caught Indian Muslims into the crossfire. War broke out in 1939. Fascism in Europe had reached its fever pitch, and when Hitler marched into Poland and then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor a few years later, the world experienced round two of imperial competition, and Burma, like many other countries, was caught in the middle. The entry of Imperial Japan into Burma and just the experience of World War II was short in terms of its time frame, but the quality of this impact was quite long lasting. During the war, there were two developments uh, which occurred, which would become the next stumbling blocks, if you like, of Burma's late 20th and 21st century struggle. So the first development was the Burma Independence Army, later which became the National Burmese Army, or in Burmese it's called Tatmadaw. And the second development was the formation of the first, quote, national political party, which brought under its wing a host of other smaller parties under one banner, and they called themselves the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League. This party fought against the Japanese. Now, the Burmese Independence Army initially had fought against the British with the Japanese, but when the tide turned at the last few months, they switched to fighting against the Japanese once the British uh, resecured the upper hand. Um, and the formation of the Burmese army was important for two reasons. Firstly, it was the first, uh, quote, indigenous Burmese army since colonial times. So it was the first time that Burmese or Burmans were back into the military. And secondly, many of the leaders of the military dictatorship that would soon follow after 1947 were veterans or soldiers raised and trained in this army. So the present army is seen as a direct heir, like a bloodline, to the Burmese Independence Army, who for most people in Burma are viewed as heroes who withstood um, external invasions from foreigners. Okay, so I'm going to stop here for part one, uh, so we'll take a pause at 1945, and then in part two we'll discuss the following turbulent developments in Burma's more recent history, the civil wars, the military coup of 1962, and the following dictatorship. Um, we'll look at Burma's version of democracy and the nature of capitalism which developed within this very isolated and sealed off country um, in, during the Cold War period. Thank you for listening. Make sure to tune in to part two.